spinal cord anatomy. It's often the case that a seemingly complicated neuroanatomy can be simplified. Spinal cord anatomy is a good example of that, and actually many spinal cord disorders can be diagnosed clinically by understanding just a few of the key spinal cord tracts. The first tract we're going to think about is to do with pain and temperature perception. So this is felt in the skin and the impulses are carried by small unmyelinated nerves to the spinal cord where almost immediately they decussate and then ascend in the spinothalamic tract. The second tract system I want to talk about is to do with feelings of vibration and joint position sense. These impulses are conveyed in large myelinated nerve fibres to the spinal cord and upon entering the spinal cord through the dorsal root they immediately go to the dorsal columns and then they ascend ipsilaterally. They get to the medial limb niscus in the brainstem and at that point they decussate. The third tract system I want to talk about is the motor system. So impulses are generated in the motor cortex, they pass down in white matter tracts through the internal capsule downwards to the brainstem where they decussate at the level of the medulla and then they descend in the corticospinal tracts. They exit the spinal cord via the anterior root and synapse with an anterior horn cell which then gives rise to the motor nerve. We can use this knowledge to understand some well-known spinal cord syndromes. So for instance, brown saccade syndrome is a hemisection of the spinal cord. Because of the way the tracts decussate, this means that ipsilaterally to the lesion you see upper motor neuron signs. For instance, pyramidal weakness, brisk reflexes and upgoing planters. Also ipsilaterally you see proprioceptive and vibration loss and that's because of the dorsal column involvement. Contralateral to the lesion there is a loss of pain and temperature sensation because of the way those fibres decussate upon entering the spinal cord. Anterior spinal artery thrombosis is caused by a blockage of the anterior spinal artery which supplies the anterior two-thirds of the spinal cord. This affects the corticospinal tracts and produces severe weakness and upper motor neuron signs below the level of the lesion. The lesion also affects the spinothalamic tracts which means that below the level of the lesion there is anaesthesia. The dorsal columns are spared having a separate blood supply and therefore vibration and proprioception may be intact. The third syndrome is syringomyelia. This is an expansion of the central canal within the spinal cord and as that lesion expands you get damage initially to the decussating spinothalamic fibres. This means that patients develop disruptions in pain and temperature sensation usually over the arms and shoulders in this cape-like distribution. It's very unusual for the syrinx to be sufficiently large to affect the dorsal columns and therefore vibration and joint position sense are spared. Sometimes as the syrinx expands you start to get involvement of the anterior horns which means that you see lower motor neuron signs such as wasting at the level of the lesion, so for instance in the hands. As the syrinx enlarges it can start to affect the corticospinal tracts and that means that below the level of the lesion you may see upper motor neuron signs such as increased tone, brisk reflexes and upgoing planters.